So I'm not sure how many people know this about me, but it's about time you find out I'm a huge James Bond fan. Like, really big. Uh, just ask Emma or my parents uh, who have to deal with this. So um, today's gospel passage made me think of a James Bond movie. And that movie is called License to Kill. It's, I think, one of the most underrated movies, and it's starring one of the most underrated Bond actors, Timothy Dalton. I'm sure some of you have seen that one. The namesake of this movie is, of course, a, a license, a special kind of license granted to special kind of operatives like Bond who uh, uh, are licensed to initiate the use of lethal force in the pursuit of their official objective, mission. Of course, James Bond is the most famous holder of a license to kill in the whole world. But in this movie, 007 goes rogue. And the reason why is that the movie begins with Bond uh, accompanying his friend Felix Leiter of the CIA, sort of his American counterpart, to uh, Leiter's wedding in Key West. But on the way, they are diverted by the DEA. So we have a lot of agencies in play here. MI6, CIA, DEA. Uh, it's a big party. And the reason why they're diverted is that there is an opportunity to capture this notorious and dangerous drug lord. So they go and, and do this. They, they get this guy arrested. And the wedding uh, proceeds without hitch, and it's all great. However, this drug lord bribes a DEA agent, and he gets out of prison. And he seeks revenge on Felix Leiter. He um, feeds Leiter to a shark and has his wife murdered. And steals all of Leiter's very sensitive and classified CIA files, which of course puts all sorts of other people at risk who are embedded in various criminal organizations around the world. So Bond begins an investigation to try to figure this out and put an end to uh, this drug lord's um, reign of terror. And uh, he is interrupted by this by his boss, M, who summons him to the Ernest Hemingway house, still in Key West, um, to uh, tell him he's on assignment to Istanbul. Now, I was in Key West with Emma last year, and I made her take a picture of me in this very spot where this conversation happened. Uh, it, was, it didn't end up being a very good picture, but it's a good memory for me. So, uh, so Bond says, uh, I'm not finished here. And M says, let the Americans handle it. And Bond says, well, they're not going to do anything because the drug lord had vanished, presumably left the country, uh, and extradition probably wasn't going to happen because we, know, we all know that drug lords tend to have influence uh, with certain governments. So uh, Bond says, well, you have my resignation. And M says, this is not a country club, 007. And then says, well, okay, your license to kill is revoked, and you must hand over your weapon. Actually, the original title of this movie was License Revoked. Um, but when it was tested with American audiences in post-production, uh, they found that American audiences tend to associate this title with a driver's license. So that was not the effect they were going for. So it was changed to License to Kill. Now, we learn from this episode that James Bond is given something, uh, and a certain status and a certain um, license, uh, that is conditional, right? He can only keep it as long as he fulfills certain conditions, as long as he follows the rules, as long as he obeys orders. And when he refuses to do so, when he is insubordinate, that status and that license is taken away. Today's gospel, I think, raises the provocative question of whether God's forgiveness is conditional, of whether there are things we can do or not do that lead to our forgiveness being revoked, like James Bond's license. In other words, is God like M, a boss who will take away what they have given to us if we don't play by the rules? In today's passage, Jesus tells a parable about a man who is forgiven a great debt. He owes a king an unimaginable amount of money. We're told 10,000 talents. And this translates into something like at least a million dollars, maybe more like a billion dollars. Either way, not a debt that he could ever repay. So this man falls on his knees and pleads for more time to repay the debt. He pleads for patience, and the king mercifully forgives this debt. He cancels it. And this, of course, is a metaphor for God's gracious forgiveness of us who have fallen short in, in the various ways that we all do, 
uh, who have incurred spiritual and moral debts that we can't really repay. Now, this forgiven man then runs into somebody else who owes him some money. We're told that this amount is 100 denarii, and this is like a day's wages. So compared to 10,000 talents, the million or even billion that he owed, this is nothing. So this debtor, like the one before him, falls on his knees and pleads for patience in repaying. But unlike the king, this man shows no mercy. He throws his debtor in prison. He grabs him by the throat and throws him in prison. Word gets back to the king, and the the king summons this man and reads him the riot act, and in anger, we are told, hands him over to be tortured until he should pay his entire debt, which we know he can't repay. So at the beginning of the story, we have a man who is forgiven, and at the end of the story, we have the same man who does not seem so forgiven. And if the meaning were unclear, Jesus concludes this parable by saying, So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. These are strong and even unsettling words from Jesus. Because isn't this out of keeping with the gospel, this message that God forgives us no matter what? Well, if we're looking for a gospel of salvation and forgiveness that's disconnected from what we do and how we live, we won't find it in the gospel of Matthew. I don't think we'll find it in the Bible at all. And perhaps we actually shouldn't be all that surprised in a certain way at what Jesus is saying today, at what Jesus is warning us about today, because throughout Matthew's gospel, Jesus is quite clear that practicing forgiveness is essential, that it's non-negotiable. In the first part of today's passage, we have Jesus telling Peter to forgive others without keeping count. And much earlier in Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, of course, teaches us to love our enemies, to pray for those who do us wrong. And also in the Sermon on the Mount, he teaches his disciples the Lord's Prayer, in which he famously says, as we say every time we gather, to forgive us, we pray to, for God to forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And to put a finer point on this, Jesus concludes that teaching with um, another saying that if you forgive others, you will be forgiven. If you don't forgive others, you won't be forgiven. So Jesus is pretty clear and emphatic on this point that we must forgive others as God forgives us if we want to stay in that state of grace and forgiveness. It seems that Jesus is warning us that that in some way we can lose this gift of forgiveness that God offers and gives each of us. Why is forgiveness so important to Jesus? Why is it so vital and so central in his teachings? Well, to get at that, it might be helpful to examine what sort of thing forgiveness is and and what it isn't. Because I don't think forgiveness is like, let's say, a Christmas present that a kindly grandparent can give to a sulking, ungrateful grandchild that can be received by that grandchild regardless of their disposition. I don't think forgiveness is quite like, you know, the, the meal that parents provide for a a child of theirs who might be bullying others at school. Again, something that can be received regardless of one's condition and disposition and behavior. Rather, I think forgiveness is more like the air in our lungs. There's only room for us to inhale the next lungful when we've we've breathed out, when when we've exhaled the previous lungful, when we've shared it with others. And when we withhold forgiveness, when we refuse to forgive, when we refuse to give somebody else the breath of life that they might so desperately need, because we all need forgiveness at various points in our lives, when we withhold that, it seems that we won't be able to take in any more ourselves. And so we suffocate spiritually and morally. To use another biological, organic metaphor, It seems that our hearts are either open 
or they're closed. Now, if our hearts are open, they're able to receive God's love and forgiveness, and and therefore they're open to pass that love and forgiveness on to others. They're in this flow of love and grace and forgiveness. But if our hearts are closed, if we don't want to forgive other people, or we don't find ourselves able to, we, we shouldn't expect to be able to receive love and forgiveness from God. It's sort of closed on both sides, just as it's open on both sides. And I think this points to the reality that forgiveness from God is not a matter of rules. It's not a legalistic situation where God says, oh, I give you forgiveness, and then sees that you've broken the rules and says, oh, I'm taking that forgiveness back. You know, I don't think it's like that. I think it's more like an organic reality, like lungs, like breathing, like, like our hearts beating and opening and closing, that God creates us to live in communion with God, to live in the divine life, uh, to live in the flow of that life, and to pass that on to others, to draw others into it. And to refuse to pass that on to others is simply to step outside of the stream, to step outside of the flow. And when we're outside of that, we're in a great deal of danger, spiritually and morally. Now, this is not a message of forgive and forget. It's not a message of superficially papering over conflict and acting as if we can simply swallow our resentments and forget about it all. Because I know forgiveness is is very difficult much of the time. The conflicts that exist between people are often ones that run very deep and come with very, very deep wounds. Rather, I think this is a message of never giving up on making forgiveness and reconciliation our goal. Because not everything's in our control, right? And if not every relationship that is damaged in our lives is mended, that's not necessarily on us. And I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about. And sometimes confrontation is called for. If we know anything about Jesus, we know that he was not afraid to to confront others. He was not averse to confrontation. But I think Jesus is saying that when we find ourselves in a confrontation, That forgiveness and reconciliation is always to be the goal. Never, never revenge. Now, this is a message that might be easier to understand and to intend to follow than it is to put into practice sometimes. Because in the moment, when somebody hurts us, when somebody has stung us in some way, it's very hard to keep our hearts open to them. So what gets in the way? Well, in Matthew 18, just a couple chapters earlier, Jesus calls a child, and he takes a child, and he puts the child before his disciples, and he says, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I think Jesus is saying that it is our self-importance, our pride, that often gets in the way of forgiving like Jesus forgives, like God forgives, our lack of childlikeness. And Jesus, all throughout Matthew, I think is giving us a program for deprogramming our pride and ecocentricity and growing up in a very different way of paradoxically growing up by becoming like children. This is a path of liberation and transformation in which we are freed from the prison of being fixated on ourselves and measuring, you know, did I get what I deserve? Did that person slight me? Did that person leave me out? Etc and takes us on a path of being occupied with God and therefore being connected to life itself. Jesus calls us into communion with this God and more than that, to become like this God. And of course, Jesus is that God in flesh and blood come among us. And as, as we looked at a few weeks ago, um, when Jesus calls disciples, like he calls Peter and the rest of them, he's calling them to be like him, to do what he does to be his presence in the world. That's what we're all called to do here. That's who we're all called to be. And Pope Francis, whose um, book on uh, the environmental crisis we're going to be looking at on a few Wednesdays coming up, beginning this week, as part of our observance of the season of creation, he also wrote a book called The Name of God is Mercy. So this is what we're to be like. This is what God is like. This is who Jesus calls us to be like, merciful people 
Mercy is to be our defining quality. So where do we get the strength to do this, to be this kind of person? Because it's not, it's not easy. If it were easy, the world would look a lot different than it does. In some ways, we could say world history, at least human history, the history of human affairs, is largely defined by uh, our inability or our unwillingness to forgive others, to reconcile conflict. We instead, we escalate conflict. We make it worse. So where do we get the strength to do something different and be part of this revolution that Jesus is calling us to? We get it from the source. I think so often we are seeking validation and affirmation and a sense of self from others, from things outside of us that will never satisfy, that will never deliver. This makes us very needy. The only source of that validation and affirmation is God, our Creator, who knows us, who loves us, who is always with us. And the more time we spend attending to that connection, deepening that connection, the more centered and equanimous we will be when we deal with conflict. Uh, There's so many ways to connect with God, right? I mean, we're we're all of us gathered here to do that right now. In our day-to-day life, uh, a practice of, of contemplative prayer or meditation might be good. And I only mention that because of the, the metaphor of lungs and of breathing that I mentioned earlier. We likewise can breathe in God's love and presence and intend to breathe out that very love and presence and life into the world around us and let go of everything that's holding us back, including our grudges and our wounds, and ask for God to heal us with each inhale. When we're grounded in this way, this outflows into transformed relationships with with everybody and everything, all creatures that we come into contact with. And this sort of transformation is needed to address um, so many crises that afflict our our world today, uh, both in the human world and in the non-human world. We've really run amok, and we need to evolve, and I think Jesus is calling us to evolve. So let us go to the source again and again and find ourselves ever more deeply in the flow of God's forgiving, healing, and reconciling love. Amen.